I love people do you know what I mean so when I see an artist um, or hear the artist's music I have feeling with it that I, I can transfer into creativity you use the club nights to generate the cash to invest in your equipment to invest in your learning you were essentially getting paid at that time yeah. to learn videography honestly to be the one-stop shop for creative I want to go to labels and be able to serve as many artists as we can I do believe my, my mother felt driven to change things for us I don't think it was a goal I don't think it was like I'm now going to do x y and z and take the kids to, to the uk etc but i think her immediate thing was protection i then had to find myself who actually am i through these opinions visions that i'm having and put puzzling together this person who am i becoming together we have clarity direction and success way beyond what we ever previously thought possible here's your host frankie lee First things first, guys, before we get started with this podcast, do me a solid favor and subscribe to this on whatever platform you're listening to it right now, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. I'd appreciate if you just hit that subscribe button and it lets me know that the content that I'm putting out for you guys is hitting your ears at the right time. Much love. This podcast is sponsored by contentremover.com. So whether you're looking to remove any images, videos, search results, fake Instagram accounts, get in touch with us at contentremoval.com. Welcome back to the Frankie Lee Podcast. Today, guys, I have got another legendary guest for you. This man, he formed Firmative Media, and honestly, he's done some unbelievable bits. Dami Suo, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, man. Thank you. Mate, I've been excited about having this conversation for for a long time, man. I've been to, How long have we been talking about this? Six years, maybe. Six years. You reckon six years? Like six years, actually, are you serious? We've, we've been talking about meeting, yeah, yeah, firstly, yeah, yeah, before you yeah, start yeah, the podcast, just yeah, like, we need to catch up, yeah, we've yeah, got the same yeah, friends, yeah, yeah. mutual friends, and yeah. then later on down the line, when you get yeah. the podcast, we've been just been talking about it since you launched. Remember, even before <laughs> you started the podcast, you were talking, asking me about um, advice, like, how yeah. do I get started, da 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 I didn't even realise, yeah. um, I didn't even realise how far we'd gone back in terms of advice about podcasts and all that stuff until you, you said to me pre-roll, you know, about me asking and all this stuff. And it's like mad, but, um, mate, your journey has been fantastic. And to give, to give a bit of context to the audience, like you've obviously formulate, you've, and I'm just going to give them an overview of the story. And then I want you to, I want you to, I really want to go back to your, to your childhood and go from there. But it's like, you know, you're a kid that's come from Africa. Obviously you've come to the UK not you've obviously had to learn the language and get everything moving like that and then you've had to accentuate and had to become a creative then you've gone from creative into business and then you go from business into obviously having one of the one of the bigger agencies out there creating content at the highest level for all these music videos for Atlantic Records and everything and I just think that your story is one that hasn't been told and I really wanted to kind of really wanted to do do that today bro like I just wanted to really just show the audience how you can go from africa and come to england and make it happen the way you've made it happen man and honestly before we even start going down the path of this <laughs> i just want to say i'm proud as hell for what you've achieved mate because i've watched for like you say six years and i've seen you blow it up so mad respect for that mate. mad respect there's a lot thank you for having me on this man i think because i've seen how successful your podcast has been yeah i'm actually overwhelmed by what you just said because you know i'm in the process right now like i've not you know like got to the place where i'd love to be but it's just so nice and refreshing to see someone like yourself who's watched the journey and kind of like appreciate it for what it is because you know as an entrepreneur you kind of find yourself in this world where you feel like it's your own little world so for you to say that man it it means a lot it's also encouraging so well i think we both appreciate from both our kind of stories Mm. of how we've both gone on in the last few years of how much work we've actually both put in to get to that point so it's kind of a that that mutual respect and, and i have a mad, mad amount of respect for you because honestly it's just been phenomenal to watch from a personal standpoint from australia being in australia and watching what you've done in terms of all these mu- top level music like 
give me some names of some of the music videos you've produced and then we'll go into your backstory of how you've got to that point but some of the names is like uh, what was what was that DJ got that top DJ guy um Dawson Dawes Dawes <laughs> Dawes it- we're, we're actually uh Nathan Dawes when does the podcast come out well whatever well, we're shooting his music video next week and it's like a new really cool concept which is in our beefer completely new but yeah he's um he's a UK producer DJ who's already in the top charts at the moment so I'm really excited about that and I guess the basis of what we do is content creation right like uh, we've gone from sort of doing your minimal pieces of content that an artist needs to be present on digital in fact I can just kind of like flick back on what we actually do for yeah, frantic, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. so remember back in the day it was like you you needed to go to a shop to buy a CD to understand what kind of music is there and there as you picked up your CD you'd find artwork that's been designed by someone unknown whatever uh, there's a picture maybe of that artist and that's how you'd basically be able to find the music and buy it and have it and like now if the CDs don't exist tapes don't exist there's new ways in which artists have to get their music out digitally especially on social we're that bridge where we'll connect the artist with their fans you know and some people might just overarch it and call it content creation it is but actually it's the very basis of marketing an artist on digital presence so you can actually see them so before when you'd go to the shop you now go on spotify you might consume the music based on an ad that you saw we want to be there creating that piece of content that you consumed to then get to the artist you might be a fan of new music that's come out but you don't know how good it's going to be because you might not be spending as much tv um, as much time as you did on tv and so again going back before you'd have a music video that you've watched on mtv probably yeah, And then you'd be attracted to the culture of what you've seen and then you'd purchase the music that way. Some people don't even watch TV anymore. I mean, I, I, I don't really like watch TV. So we want to be able to create uh, like, you know, like social ads that would capture you to watch the music video. That's how Affirmative started off. And you know, like we'll do those basic um, reaches. So we'll design pieces of artwork, would take photos of the artist, turn it into artwork and we'd do all that in-house and then later on because of the skill sets I've learned from university and stuff like that and just kind of like self-taught would edit your videos would then go on to production and that's where we've now come on to we're now doing our own product we've got our own production side where we would actually shoot your whole music video produce it with a crew of people and then pretty much to be honest in the last few months yeah is when we've gone into production beforehand uh would assist other production companies so now we do the whole almost three doing it all in-house yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we'll produce the music we'll do the behind the scenes a lot of what we're doing leading up was kind of like the behind the scenes and the content around the artist and the music video would sit alone with a production company but now we've had a lot of labels trust that formula does work and we know what we are doing you know and And i I suppose it's that youth youthful essence that you've brought into it as well like you know the platforms you've grown up through the platforms and you're connected to those platforms yeah so you can help them correlate that into a message for the artist that allows that artist to get the best return on investment for both the record label and the artist on the social platforms yeah in terms of the the content that's created and how it engages with that audience exactly and look like as an individual a freelance creative you're trained to be maybe a producer you're uh, trained to be camera operator etc right yeah but you think because we've gone from the back end of it where we understand that we can facilitate artwork all the things that an artist needs for a Mac marketing pack package that would go on social media, we now can go in there at the benefit of the artist, not just at the benefit of the service. Best example I'd say is if you're a camera operator, you go, film your things, see you later, done my day, day rate, right? We're, we're not interested in just doing that. We're interested in what's the song, what's the creative, let's do it all. So we'll do, we'll happily do photos, videos, we'll come up with a creative of what the photo looks like, what the design looks like. And then at that point, I creative direct within Firmative as to who does what pit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then because I, I, I've been there and I 
done the designing, the artwork, and I can sh- I'm a self shooter. I then can also give my services, say editing the music video or directing the music video. But the future of that for me is to give more opportunities to creators like myself in the music space, the, the thing that I'm passionate about, and then be able to also connect and facilitate service the artist and be with them, know that they can trust me, affirmative, to kind of like elevate, elevate, every elevate music. every piece of their content because obviously 100%. they've spent that time deep, you know, in in their own time writing that song, putting that. Have it. They the, the artist I know from speaking to other artists. The artist when they create that song probably has a vision for how that music video goes, mm. and how it used to go in the old days was like the company used to try like the, the like a Universal or someone like that used to come in and try and direct how, how that fit how that felt. Mm. Whereas now I think we're going into a time where the artist can come can come to the to like the middle agency like you that works for that is trusted by the record label and kind of and you can kind of together you can create their vision. Yeah. And, and add more feeling and more connection to the audience by doing that. 100%. And, and the other thing, you know, something that's missed out is I will bring passion like no other for creative. I'm not like, like I said, like the creative process for me is an obsession, just like the artist has obsession of the creative process in music. For me, visuals uh, you know pictures like the way I just told you to move your bottle you know that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. that's within me it's it's also not just something I've learned on doing with cameras it's something I do in general you know with people I'll, I'll, I'll I know how people move I can mimic people's movements and I, I, lo- I love people do you know what I mean so when I see an artist um, or hear the artist's music I have feeling with it that I, I can transfer into creativity so you almost have a vision in yourself when as a creative as as when you listen to a piece of music you kind of thinking to yourself how that can be shot and how that and how that and your vision for how that music video can cut can look you know the 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 way the way they're dressed in that video and everything like that you can yeah. see it all from from conception 100 percent. and the other side of it is i can see the things i can't see so like if an artist comes up with music that i think my experience doesn't really attached to I won't force that that's where I can go I know a director like Troy Rusko who's absolutely amazing who I can call up on and say hey look like this is not my area we'll get you on board I'll give you the overarching brief of where we're at but this is this is your dance floor this is where you get to create and shine you know and almost that self-awareness piece how did you go about getting that much self-awareness all comes down to where I was born and how I ended up here. Really, I, lo- I love yeah. it because I want to. I want to go there. I want to. I want to <laughs> go there because obviously, yeah. so you were born in in Africa, right? Yeah. And you f- you moved over to the UK at, at twelve. So just give me a bit of an insight into what life was like growing up in in Africa for you. Yeah. By the way, that that's uh, like that was just TV education. Though, cause actually, I thought, do you want to take me back to where I I, I started? But yeah, but essentially, I, I was born in Zambia in a small town called Mufulira, and within within that city, uh, we were essentially not programmed, but we knew that the reality was the dreams that we watched on TV. Um, may not have come to fruition like would never live the uk life or the western life or because our you knew that as kids oh yeah and it's funny you say that because how do i know that I, I, you just know you know you don't have access to the things you're seeing on tv you know because they're not in your environment you you walk out and your life is totally different from what you're seeing on on television uh, you don't have access to those things you're not going to be in a position to, to 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 live the lifestyle that you're watching people your age are living, or you know you watch American Westernized kind of like, uh, or even British films, and you just know you're not going to be able to have the things that they have, and what you have is is the things that you got to be content with, and there's happiness in that. You're and there's where's the happiness in that. I think the happiness comes from something I have to remind myself all the time. It comes from being close with those who care about you, you know, your family. And so a lot of African families are really tight and close. Um, 
you spend a lot of your time trying to do things with your family because you don't have the material things to look up for. You can watch them on TV for an hour and then it's gone. You're back to normal, to live time with your family, to spend, um, uh, to do activities with family. Everything is family based and your happiness is within those moments. Yeah. And so that that's all my sort of life was, is my family, um, my education. And the dreams I have, yeah, you can watch it on TV for a little bit. So, never, so, so as yeah. a as a as a child, mm. what kind of dreams did you did you kind of have in that mind of yours? To, uh, is it everything? Is it everything that you dream then is what you live in now, or what, what were your dreams then? Um, I just I had so much frustration because when I grew up, I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time on my own, and I remember that being quite a vivid moment and. I remember always walking from school to my parents' house and it's like a 45-minute walk. And I was just dream of being in a movie, you know, because that's what I was seeing and how those people in those movies felt. You know, they felt like powerful men. Uh, they felt like they can achieve anything if they believe in it. And so those dreams were quite rapid. I'd daydream a lot, you know, walking home. I'd love the 45-minute walk. I'd pick up sticks and you know, pretend to be in a film shooting, pretend to be acting. I'd talk to myself all the time, just almost living a fantasy that I thought I'd never have the opportunity to have. And that that was my way of kind of expressing that frustration. And in so much isolation, a lot of the times, I enjoyed that a lot more than kind of like what my presence was because I just felt like I, I could do more and I just didn't have the facilities to do more. I kind of feel like you were visualizing your future and mm. kind of manifesting it in that moment. Because I, when I was listening to you say that, mm. like you didn't pr- particularly, you, you appreciated your family life and the life that you had and the joy that you had in that moment with your family. Mm. But you wanted more for yourself outside of that. So you were on those walks, which are w- all a walk is, is, is essentially is if you're not, if you, as long as you're not on an iPhone or, or got earphones plugged in, a walk is a, is a, is a, is a great form of meditation. And mm-hmm. Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about that. And I think what you were doing at the time, which you may or may not have realized, was I think you were visualizing everything that you wanted in your life and kind of manifesting it into a kind of into 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 a, into a, into a, like a like a film that you constantly saw on repeat in your mind, and you're putting that out into the world. I mean, I don't know if that's that's a, that's it, kind of what I just felt when you no, said that. Uh, literally, you almost almost kind of like made me tear up because I think that's so true, and I didn't realize I was doing that because I already have the joy of being around my family, but I wanted more for myself individually, and so those long walks that you would say, yeah, were me manifesting because. I didn't even know what obviously manifesting was, but I, I, I'm dreaming and walking and talking to myself with sticks. And uh, a lot of people, neighbours would laugh, ah, oh, Dimmy, you're walking around again. I'd just be like, you know, like, this is my time. This is me fantasising and what I wish I could do, you know, because I, I feel it in my heart that I can do more than what I'm doing yeah. then as a young boy, you know? Because you don't have to, a lot of people don't realise this, you don't have to be what you're born into. Mm. But I, and I was saying to this this before the podcast, like one of the things that I believe about about us as a, as, a, as a race of humans is the fact that I believe that we're we're here to answer all all our shadows along our journey mm. and kind of like accentuate through that and and learn through that. And it's just it just so happens that you were born in Africa and you wanted more for yourself, so you've gone and gone. Okay, well, and you 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 subconsciously knew this as a, as a child. <laughs> Because you were free. That's when we were most free. And you thought, do you know what? Well, I love this reality in terms of my family, but I just want more. So I'm going to imagine what that can be like. And you had no limits on that imagination and what that imagination could be because you were f- so free. Yeah, exactly that. And I'd look forward to my walk because I was so in, in a space where there was no fear to dream. That nothing would go wrong. It's all in my head. I, I kind of get the realism of the fact that it's not real, but I'm going to enjoy it for what it is. I'm going to enjoy this fantasy for what it is. So I spend an enormous amount of time, my parents would tell you, and my friends would tell you, or on my own, just really like uh, blowing these fantasies and 
really trying to get close, as close as I can to them. And to a certain extent, I still do that. I still spend, try and spend enough time on my own to think and take in what what more there is to life. Obviously, being present for sure in in what I currently have, but certainly, you know, fantasizing of what more I can do, what more, how more, how much more I can serve and stuff like that. So, and all my my family, uh, I was brought up in in a Christian family, and I myself are. Christian so there's a lot of prayer and later on as I grow up there's a lot of meditation as well that adds to that so it's been an interesting journey man and it's funny you got that out of me because I have thought about that those walks I, that frequent I, I just it just it's just I just when you said it to me instantly I felt and I felt like a knowing in me that, that that's kind of what was happening I just didn't know whether you'd potentially realized that what was that's what was happening at that time mm. But I, th- I think you, I think you went so deep mm-hmm. into into what life could be and what life could look like for me. I think that's what's that's what you're living now. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, you know, a lot of other things kind of happened, which mapped my not conclusion, but it probably drove me even further into this dream. And I've never spoken to you about this, but. Essentially, when I was six years old, you remember what I told you about my family being close because it's what was reality. Um, yeah. An incident happened that pretty much changed our family for, forever, essentially. My mother's parents, um, mom, and my mum's mother and dad, like, as my mum was so young, she always used to sort of leave me with my grandparents who were already, like, in, in business. And there was, a, there was an evening uh, in 1996 when I was seven years old I'm 33 now so do the maths but um that night w- would would change but also help me sort of give me purpose and meaning for the rest of my life we were all waiting at my grandparents parent uh, house for us to go to farm to a farm that was ours and it was like the celebration it was like think about the equivalence of you being excited with your family to go to our beef or a holiday whatever like yeah. Spain we were excited to go to the farm on our bus. Um, my grandparents were, they, they did all right, you know, so we were in a safe house. But all that comes with is a little bit of greed because a lot of people in Africa didn't have what we had, which was an okay family. And so my granddad was followed by some four, four armed men, essentially, who had crossed over from Congo. Zambia is quite close to the Congo DR and back in 96 there was quite a lot of, of wars happening access to weapons there's actually been some films that I've seen recently um, uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll get back. there's one with Nicolas Cage which really reminds me of what's happening that a lot of weapons were being dropped off in in Africa and Congo a lot of people just, just had them um, and so my grandparents got followed to, my granddad got followed to his house and try to lock into the house, but the, the guys were in a mission to essentially get money from my parents, my grandparents. The, we didn't have any money at the house. They were wrong. They just had an okay family life. So whoever told them we had this crazy amount of money, we had love. Do you know what I mean? We had a family. So everyone in the family was there, apart from my mum, who at, in that evening was at home. But who was there was my cousin who's my uh my granddad's son and then their daughters three of them than me um and so they came in broke into the house just just, you know literally started shooting people in the house and killed my grandparents and killed my grandma and then also shot my ankle in you know the shoulder but that experience was interesting because I guess you watch all these things on TV and their fantasies and their stuff about that report about crime in general, but you get to see it in real life. You then, as a wish, child as well, you wish this is a dream. This like this can't be true. Like I, I, I love fantasizing, but let's take this out because this can't be real. And you know, there was a moment there where, as the guys were leaving. My granddad was killed, but my grandma was still sort of breathing just before she died. 
And because we all know we're about to lose her, uh, I remember a moment where my uncle, who was shot in the shoulder, was saying, can I get some help just to go into the other room? And despite the person who was in the room being older, um, didn't want to help, but I stood up and I was something in me was like, I'm going to help him get to the other room to see grandma. Um, that also just showed a bit of character of who I am now in faced with fear. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll fight against that. So I helped him go to the other room. Uh, we saw grandma, grandma was pretty much saying to me like, look, you don't have to cry. You'll be fine. Like she was calm. You know, she was the one dying, but I remember her looking at me thinking, you're going to be fine. This this is just the moment. This is part of life. This is the circle, but you're going to be fine. And I was the one crying. <laughs> so but that, for me, is a moment that I think, one, that a big lesson for me is like in life's just way too short. And if I'm going to have another breath, because she, she's about to have her last one, I'm going to use every single breath I've got really like, not only serving the people I meet, but I'm going to try and walk into every room with as much love and empathy as, as my grandparents gave me when she, she was having her last breath. And so that's gone with me in a really positive way. It's gone very sideways for some family members who are still angry today um, just because of life's not fair, you know. How, how could you... They, they, they've gone into different places, basically. But I was lucky enough to take the good that was left from those moments and I've taken that I take it every single day when I wake up you know into my business into the people I meet and just reminded and humbled by even the progress of the business now because I'm trying to implement as much of that spirit and love into what I do and how much I care um so yeah. powerful mate yeah. so powerful honestly mate I was Mate, honestly, that's so powerful. I just can't. Even, I can't even tell you. There's not many people that can take a situation like that where they've actually seen a family member. Not only seen family members that have got shot, but then to to go through that and see that, and then to take the powerful lesson, but take empathy through life, and to understand that you're you are not the situation. Your life is way bigger than the situation. And then and then to accentuate through that is some powerful stuff, mate. Because like you said, some of your family members have took that and, and they've allowed that to disempower the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. And what people have got to understand is that every thing that happens to you, you, you can't take the victim mentality to it. Because if you do, it disempowers the rest of your life. And there is a very powerful lesson in everything that we face in life. And part of that lesson has allowed you to achieve everything else in life. Yeah, 100%. And I, I, and I think, you know, I was, in a sense, lucky enough for my grandma to say that to me. It's a kind of final last words in the sense that she she was saying, you know, it's fine, you, you know, you're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. So I've taken that as a way of, I need to take what she's saying and be okay with what's happened. And the sooner I can be, the sort of better I can almost take that as a powerful way to also share that with someone else who needs to hear it. You know, it almost gave me this, I don't know, it's always felt like purpose and everywhere I've gone, I've always remembered it. It just felt like everyone I, I meet should feel the same love I felt. In, in that moment you know so you felt in that moment unconditional love yeah. and you felt your grandma giving you that ultimate freedom of saying you're going to be okay go and do what you're going to go and do yeah literally and i can i can i can't i i, I can never describe it because i saw her a lot you know in my dreams after and the message continued in the sense that that's how I felt and so projected every time I dreamt about her, she'd always say the same thing. You're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. And so I, I took a lot of love from that. And in, as an entrepreneur, you have your dark times, right? Where things work out, um, things don't, but when, when they really don't, it's really like taking me through those dark moments that 
my grandma said it was going to be okay when she was in the worst pain right just about to to leave this world and so while I have all this breath you know who am I to complain uh about struggles um and my fears you know have to go for things that potentially I'd feel uncomfortable doing but I know I, I know that they, they have great morals and they have um the principles in which I believe in they are me and so I should really like strive to 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 be the best person I can be you know a lot yeah and the way that you've and the way that you have taken from such a dark situation and 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 obviously as you're producing content and music videos and everything you're doing nowadays Mm. the way that you're approaching that all from a place of love Mm. after such adversity is remarkable because I don't know if I could have dealt with the same situation in the same way Mm. So I'm just, <laughs> mate, I'm, because I'm, I'm, I didn't know that story, see, before this podcast, and that's why I've left a lot of questions unanswered between me and you over the years, because I knew there was so much power in this being told in this moment. I mean, mate, when you was telling me that, I could feel, I'm, I'm, I feel teared up, because I know, I can only imagine what that feels like as a human being to see that in front of you and your family and not there's not many people in the western world that have have had that experience Mm. you know and just and just it just wouldn't just wouldn't happen but full credit for you and the way that you've took it and kind of used it to propel you after that point in time did you then is that when your family thought you've got to leave africa and and you've got to go somewhere it's gone somewhere a bit more safer or yeah i I don't i don't think it was immediate for them but I, I do believe my my mother sort of felt driven to change things for us. Um, I don't think it was, I don't think it was a goal. It, I don't think it was like, I'm now going to do X, Y, and Z and take the kids to, to, to the UK, etc. But I think her immediate thing was protection. Yeah. Protect, not just me, but everyone in the family. So my mum took on, a really strong role at a very young age um, to ensure everyone was educated and we got out of this alive, you know, because they, my mum's family, were in control of a lot of the upbringings of the family, the culture and bringing people together. My mum took on that role at a young age and so did my my dad. You know, he decided he it was his mission to ensure that everyone fought through this, you know, got through it and not a single person was going to be left behind. So I think as that conscious for protection grew, my mum intuitionally started to think of more and more ideas of how we can diversify. And I remember there was a moment actually when one of her friends went to the UK and there was an opportunity in the UK because my mum's a nurse and she's been a nurse since, since I was born and um, one of her friends managed to get an opportunity to go to the UK to help Boopa up, uh, Boopa, which is the home yeah, care. Yeah. And um, she, even though she was qualified to do nursing properly, she saw, looked at that as an opportunity to continue the expression she had earlier about how we were going to be safe. And me being her firstborn, it was our priority. And... I got a little brother, so her f- into me, into um, her immediate family, myself and my little brother. Uh, she just decided that maybe there's a chance that they can go to the UK. Initially, she thought they can come and visit, but <laughs> you probably laugh at this one when she was telling me about you can come visit in the UK. So when she, basically she went, she got the job and she was going to be there for three years, make enough money to take us to good schools and continue sort of protection. Um, sort of idea for us but when she went to the UK I was on the phone to her and I was selling the dream because of those fantasies I had right and I thought oh my god this could come true right so whenever mum would say oh you should come visit uh, we'll get you down it's like not visiting we're moving up we've got to move up so I was selling it to her I've learned how to clean well I can cook, I can come there, take the stress off you, mum. I'll clean the house, da-da-da-da. I'm selling it like the movies I see. 
and how so, they, so this is what you were dreaming on yeah, them walks becomes reality and my opportunity is to sell so it was all about the UK yeah well it, it was in my head America I think it was in the idea but my mum went to the UK and I thought well UK, America wh- whatever like it's I'll get the things I want in the US in the UK yeah like, um, and so when she came to the UK, I was like, well, America, UK, that's where I'm going. Um, and I somehow convinced her to come. She, was was it some, was it easy to immigrate to the UK back then? Cause I know it's, it gets more and more difficult every year. Yeah. I think what it was is, um, the UK needed help in terms of healthcare. There was a lot of people in the UK that didn't want to take care of older people. Um, just because of the environment that they're in, you know. Not a lot of people love taking care of those jobs. And so I think what the UK did is opened up those opportunities for, I guess, nurses who were living in third world countries. Uh, Just to say, poor countries, because Zambia is one of the poorest countries in, in the world. And I think, you know, that was an open opportunity for also migrating to the UK as a almost like a trade off. Yeah. Migrate to the UK, you take care of our people and we we'll take care to, of you. We'll take care of you. And I think my mum wanted to be a senior nurse. It was a great opportunity to just get started, make enough money, protect my family and become a nurse. How did how did it feel when you first arrive in the UK? I mean you don't know you presume at this point have you learned English off the T V or what what's what's going on in, in regards so, to all that? Something a lot of people don't know is a lot of schools in, like I went to a good school, um, a lot of good schools in Africa speak English. They they actually stop you from speaking your local language because they want you to be, uh, to have English as your first language. It is broken English when you compare it to... English, English, Eng- yeah. In- yeah, the English accent essentially. But arguably the English calibers are even a year advanced in, in general. So you actually learn more information than what you actually get from schools in, in the UK. That's what I found anyway. I was at quite quite advanced when I came to the UK in terms of like maths and English. So you, your reading um, sounds broken, uh, but you're in, like, the intuition that your peers have is almost the same or better. It's, it's mad when you think yeah. about that as a concept, the fact that you know, in Gambia, they'd the rather the rather uh, teach you a language that's that's foreign to you rather than having you pick up your local dialect because they yeah. they know that you, that you are better off with an English with an English as a, as a as a first language. Yeah, that's that's a, that that's dumbfounding to me because most most cultures want to keep their own dialect; they don't want to expand into English as much. No, but well, look in in also Zambia was part of the British colonies um, and obviously it got, it got its independence in 1964 but a lot of the principles stayed you know so it's an English speaking country uh, and like say Congo which is a French speaking country because of the colonies so all yeah. of it kind of stems back from history and so Zambia being uh, an English part of it they, they, they want to keep the same values that we have in the UK but we're just not rich enough to be like the UK. So, yeah. so the idea as far as like the country is is there and the, the country is beautiful, uh, as you know, uh, but it's, it's certainly not as rich as the UK and it hasn't got the access that I kind of have here. Did you find when you came over here to the schools, I mean, I mean, some people, I mean, I've not seen this myself yeah. and I've seen it spoken about, I've seen it spoken about a lot mm especially internationally and I've not I've not seen it dramatically in England but I want to ask you from your experiences like was there a lot of problems with like racism and stuff like that growing up or was that something that you didn't really experience here it's interesting you asked that there was culture shock firstly racism second and third confusion to be honest I I'm 12 years old I can speak English but it sounds like I can't to the English friends so I've got intuition. They think I don't. I have education and life experience. Being young and mature and so much life experience, my peers in England don't think I am. So you almost, 
trying to just consume information. This is how I found myself. So when I first came to the UK, it was I had my ideas. I thought the world I'm going into is similar to to my world. Only it's got loads of white people who speak uh, in such in, in an English accent. Easy. It wasn't easy. Um, I started off the first day turning up in shorts. Found out the weather didn't like that. Um, Dress for the weather you want, not for the weather you got though. You learn that real quick. There, there was a little bit of sun and I found out there's a fake sun in the UK. I was like, bomb. Like, this is, this is freezing. I, I can't even, yeah. And then, so that was the first one. My shorts were like up here. I got, I'm long limbed. And so everyone was like, why has this guy got, not only is he wearing shorts, but there are small shorts. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, you know, leave it to me. But generally I was welcomed at my school. I was the only black guy in Whittlesey. Really? The only black guy in Wilson's at my school. And so it was a culture shock for them. It was a culture shock for me. And we were almost sharing this shock together. Yeah. Because Wilson, and like a lot of British places, like say Brixton in London, who have multicultural black people, Ghanaian, da, 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 every, everywhere, you know, Africa, Jamaica, Wilson people, people my age, haven't seen a black guy in the flesh. They've watched black people on TV. So, so there's it's a culture shock to them as well. Because they're, lo- they're looking at me and going, you must be like X who I watched on TV. And even, say so the girls, some girls who I was attracted to or were attracted to me compared me. Oh, you must be attracted because this person is. And out of observation, I started to wiggle my way or build character through opinions because I I wanted to fit in. So I was taking what she said, what Sarah said. So, oh. so essentially then, through your childhood, mm. you weren't even your true self in a, in a sense. No. You were you were a character mm. of formulated from, from, from essentially like TV. Like yeah. because you were formulated by their T V opinions of you and your T V opinions of how the of how a guy from from Africa turns up in England. Yeah, hundred percent. You're probably starting to see why I'm yeah. into video and why I do what I do, because that 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 those perceptions were saving me, but also would later on play against me in the sense because I then had to find myself. Who who actually am I through these opinions and visions that I'm having and put puzzling together this person? Who am I becoming? So when you leave school at this point, are you now? confused then as to who you who you actually truly are yeah so how what what did you what did you when, when you leave school what do you actually what did you actually feel like yeah so, so once once i left school i knew i wanted more so i started to feel like who 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 am i trying to be i started to ask a lot of questions who have i been who am i trying to be now so i was confused to be honest probably the best way to put it i think a lot of a lot of people who listen to this podcast will resonate fully with that because there's a lot of people who leave school and it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are and where you're from but a lot of people have played a character Mm. i think even if i look at my childhood i played a character Mm. i played the joker because if i was the joker then i wasn't the i wasn't i wasn't Austra- Austra- you know, I had the geeky friends down here. I had the had the the most popular kids over here. Mm. I could just sit in that middle ground, mm. be the Joker. And no one, no one messed around with me. Mm. But it didn't, it didn't show every side of me, yeah. because I was playing that role. Do you see what I'm saying? So I presume there's a lot of people that listen to this that are just playing a role themselves, and and that's why I just the way that you're gonna distill it now mm. and kind of show you how did you. How did you break through, like, and understand that role that you're playing? How did you get through it? Pain, I think. I think, you know, what really broke up the the scenario of making me think differently was breakups in a relationship. I think when I first kind of like had like my first relationship in in the UK, um, and you know, we broke up, and the pain I felt from that was different. I thought I had felt so much pain and so the pain started to make me think about who I really wanted to be how I wanted to ensure I could be the best person I can so I didn't 
feel pain anymore. I was trying to blind that. And then through those processes, I'd then start thinking about things that are for me. So I'd work out more and then realize, oh, I'm doing that for me, right? Like I'm actually really developing as a person. I would um, I'd put myself in scenarios or social circles of people who potentially I wasn't hanging around with. I'd leave one social circle to, to hang around with another just, just to, to see if who I am at that point is fitting in with these people. So then having the ability to connect with anyone, start, I started to discover that I'm a person who loves people. Um, I started to discover that I'm a person who loves to grow and and explore things. And so later on, when I started to, you know, when I got older, I started to pray more, meditate more and have a bit more routine and fo- that focuses on mirroring who I am as a person, I started to realize really started to get a glimpse of who I who who actually I am. You know, I started to see who Dumi is in the mirror. And it's always been the same person my you know my grandma looked at and it's like that's that's who you are. Everything else has come in has played a part in growing your confidence and it plays its part as a part of the page. But who you really are is that person with other things that have developed that makes sense yeah it does and I, and i think it's amazing that you you were your mind was open to meditation breath work all this other stuff so early mm-hmm. because i didn't discover this stuff until i was like 28 29 30 yeah. 31 you know and yeah. you've you've been you've been so deep in this for so long mate like in terms of like the We've, you've been through so much adversity over here but then to me your your childhood gave you so much abundance over here because of you, you i just have a, a knowing in me that you, that there was something within you that just knew so much that was so much more connected in terms of the the most the most kids your age when you were that age Do you know just even when you're just walking and you're daydreaming along and the way you're creating in your mind yeah. And the way that that's that's manifested in your your life today, and and what you're creating, and how you see things, and how you position yourself for opportunities, and even like you've left school at like sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, and now you're reevaluating. At that age, how many of us actually truly reevaluate? Hang on a minute. Am I truly this person? I'm. I leave as this person, but am I? Are they truly my traits, or have I picked them? Have I taken on other people's baggage and and other people's problems? Mm. Self awareness level three thousand, mate. <laughs> Self awareness yeah. level three thousand. You know what it is? It's 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 probably because I, I grew up in in churches and I, I probably never missed a Sunday uh church with my grandparents, um, on both my dad's and my mum's side. And so you're consistently praying every day. And I remember I actually got to a point when I was younger, like we talking since I could remember I could I would pray in the morning, giving thanks to today. I'd pray before food, giving thanks for the food, that we're lucky to have food on our plate. I'd pray after food, giving thanks to the fact that we food, had food. And, <laughs> and, yeah, and you know, and, and I think that is what, that is gratitude, right? Giving thanks for today. Prayer, that's, that's what I just realised, like prayer is literally like just gratitude. Gratitude, it's, yeah. It's just, it's, it's the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's like literally like, before we start going out there trying to create more and before we go out there always wanting more in our lives, mm. how about we take a few moments right now and just thank you for, thank for you. what I have. 100%. And, it's, and, it, and it hit me the other day. I was so frustrated. I was like, Do you know what? I put my heart and soul into this, this and this and this. Why is this not happening? Blah, 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 blah. And so, but I'm like, it is, bro settle down bring it down and, and like, i think that that awareness that you've had as a child from from doing this prayer and through the journey you've had i just it's a different it's a different level of being to be able to to be able to go through life and have that and, and I, I don't know if you i don't know I, even with i feel bad saying it but <laughs> i feel like with even with how much adversity that you've had yeah 
I feel like you've been also been very lucky to be able to have sir, that the, the other side of that, not the adversity, but like the other side of that and the lessons that have come from that. That 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 time that you spent, most kids by 12, 13, 14 years old today are, are like totally indoctrinated into TikTok, bro. You were, <laughs> you were spending it with family. You didn't have all the technology and all the no. stuff. And, you, and you've just, and that's, that's, I think that's really helped you. It really, uh, honestly, I count myself really lucky because obviously I'm in the tech, world now where everyone has a phone mobile phone and then i'm completely the other side right where you don't have almost anything and all you have is your family that that's it and 12 years of solid that was all we did spend time with family and then you come to the uk and you're exposed to so much and you're exposed to so many feelings and so you're then in this world trying to map who you are exactly uh, what matters and what doesn't what's real and what's not and the older you get you start puzzling things together and going oh my god that connects with that and this connects with that and who, who where do I fit in you know and then you're spending every day don't get me wrong my gratitude has been disturbed a lot in my growth because I've met good friends like alcohol you know I've met nightclubs and um a lot's happened in between sort of that period and there was actually a pause of who I was to just complete confusion and allowing chaos to be what it was to then find myself, you know. And I, I think I'm 33 now, but it wasn't until I was 28 or when I really focused on affirmative that I really went back to like that younger boy who was a little bit more grounded within gratitude because I also did follow the chaos, you know. I think a lot of, I mean, I, I never have personally on a personal level followed the chaos in terms of the chaos, the chaos that, that, well, let me, let me just define the chaos. The chaos, the chaos that you're talking about is drink, drugs, alcohol. Like, not so much drugs. Drinking. Not, 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 yeah, but, but, but the chaos that yeah. most people follow are like, oh. are like, are like your alcohol, your drugs, your smoke, and they're the chaos that most people f- fall into at some oh, point in yeah. time, yeah? Yeah, yeah? And you've obviously fallen into alcohol, not the drugs, but a lot of people have fallen into one of the three, whereas I stayed clear of all of that. Wow. I stayed clear of all of that. My, my, my biggest demons and my, the biggest questions that I had to answer at the time was all in my head. Like, cause I didn't, cause I knew at the time, like when you were a kid that I wanted more for myself, but mm. it's like, well, how do I access that? Because I hadn't been doing the walks that you'd been doing and I hadn't been, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, this, I is, do. This, I this, do. this, this is, this is, this is where like, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't witnessing this over here, this, this terrible atrocity, but then uh, because, because I wasn't in that terrible situation, I hadn't done this either. Mm. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a it's kind of a beautiful when I listen to your story and I and I kind of piece it together I'm like there's a beautiful there's a beautiful marinade here of how things have happened for you happened for you not to you but for you yeah. to allow you to accentuate and learn all this learn all this stuff and wisdom mm. to have to have that wisdom you know to come back through at 18 years old you're stood there in the mirror going hey who am I and what am I about. What were some of the biggest learnings when you asked those questions to yourself at that particular time? Like we were talking about like 18. Yeah, 18. Before yeah, chaos, yeah, pre-chaos. Yeah, pre-chaos, yeah. Um, I think I had so many insecurities that I was aware of and I knew I had a personality that was quite shy and laid back but then I was aware that I wanted more for myself, you know, just from being a younger person. And so the questions were, can I be that person? you know, I've come all the way from Africa, gone, gone through all these people. Can I step into that role that I've always wanted to be? And I was hit by fear all the time. And so the way I navigated through that was through dancing. Because while my intuition, I still think, was strong, I wasn't great at school. wasn't great at school at all. I worked really hard. I was the guy that would sacrifice the next month just studying. And my friends who studied for two hours would smash it and I'd, I'd struggle just don't have the well just didn't have the kind of like uh, education I just, just couldn't do it basically I, was, I wasn't great I wasn't going to be an A-star student and the rest of it and um, you know being able to sort of then look in the mirror going okay my intuition's right I want to be that, that person can I step in and I, dancing 
allowed me to do that because it only involved me right expressing myself so if you remember back yeah. in Peterborough Town you'd find yeah, you'd all see, see my all, circle yeah yeah all dancing yeah, all yeah, dancers all the you know your what was it like Lewis Smith Aston yeah, Merigold yeah, all that yeah, yeah, that yeah. circle we we would then dance and, 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 and can I just say for the audience the guys that Doomy's mentioning are like we're talking about Olympic gymnast mm-hmm. that's 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 now gone on and represented us on the pommel horse at like two Olympic games and medalled we're talking about a guy who's like in one of the biggest, who's who's the lead singer in one of the biggest boy bands in the UK's history, other than One Direction. Yeah. And we're talking about and 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 some other guys that have gone on to be like I think producers and yeah, other like stuff. John, John's an actor. John's a, John John Kamal. He's he's an actor. In, he's an actor in London, and he's and he's been in like The Lion King and stuff. Mm. And then you got, and, and then I can't try and remember some of them other boys that are back in those days. Like every one of every one of you mm-hmm. that was expressing yourself in that town centre on, on, I remember it, bro. But every one of you that was expressing yourself like that in that town centre as a creative, mm-hmm. um, and just trying to put life into things, has gone on and smashed it in life <laughs> a, a different on a different level. So there's something, there's something, something yeah. in in there's something that like that tells me one thing from what you just said. There's there's there. And I want you guys to all, the, all listen to this podcast to, to really f- put your ears around this point I'm going to make. The point is, your your whole role is to lean in into what your freedom of expression is to you. What is your creative flair? You've got to lean into that because that is your key to accentuate because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's simply what you've done. I didn't see it that way though. That makes sense because, you know, you do ask the question, why am I around these spaces? Because we all wanted to express something some way and um it was comfortable at that space those spaces would create in literally a circle a dancing circle was a safe space you could go in there express and everyone without fear of judgment without fear no one would judge you and you were brave enough to go up against the other person because you've been learning those dance moves don't get me wrong lewis and aston won every time but um majority of the time you, you you don't care. It's not about that. It's, it's not about, about the winning pressing. though. Yeah. Um, and it's also the overcoming of the fear of doing that. And honestly, dancing built me up, you know, because then I'd go on to continue dancing into dance crews. And that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life at the time. And through that, I also knew I was really passionate about video because of what it did to me. I, I, I was intrigued by the television and why these thoughts were coming to me through the television. And so when I was taking on courses like video production, I was taking out cameras in my um, college to shoot people dancing, to document them rapping, all these things that I was really interested in. But really I was doing that so I can, okay, I'm going to record this person, see what dance moves they do. Okay, that's the wave, That's I'll practice that, you know? And I'd use the course to keep my mum happy. But then the course became really interesting because I started to find joy in the creative ability to piece that together because youtube just launched and people would watch these videos online and go oh do me you're you're that guy that runs that i won't say what it is because people are going to search it up but it's terrible now but you're the guy that runs that thing that you shoot videos and you doc- document dances and artists etc then naturally i'd just walk around with a camera and shoot my friends like i'd shoot document my one of my best friends me and his first girlfriend who was from wales at the time document his story and make a music video out of it and go oh my god that and they'll he would watch it and show his girlfriend they'll tear up like what a beautiful moment you know and those feelings the gratitude i'd get from that and you was just capturing moments i understood that that aligned with me as well it was like it felt like i was serving a servant. serving and that is so important that you've said that you you felt like you were serving something bigger than yourself yeah and that's what purpose is mm. i think purpose because people always ask me on the question box and probably always ask you on your question box when you do Q&As and stuff, how do they find purpose? And it's all, what you've just said there is like, it's literally the purpose has to be beyond you. It has to be for something, it has to be about, be about something bigger than you. Yeah. And that's where most of your, whether, whether it was that time in that moment with your nan where your nan was that bigger point than you, whether it's that moment where you're, you're dancing and like the, you know, the expression is bigger than you. Yeah. You're expressing for other people, not just yourself. And when it's whether it's making a video for someone else where it's about creating a moment of joy in their life, that's a, everything in your life has been about. And that's where your joys come from. Yeah, 100%. And you honestly nailed it. 
um, this sounds really superstitious to anyone that's kind of listening to it, but in those prayers and kind of like moments that I had when I was younger, one of my friend's grandma um, said something really beautiful to me and it stayed with me for the rest of my life. She had uh, an epiphany, I guess, as she was praying. She, you know, she's praying and um, she goes, to me, I have a vision. And I was like, oh, what's the vision? She goes, you're, you're a fish in a pond and you have fishes come into your pond. And you move around a lot. And every time that fish goes to a different pond, you meet new fish, but you're never short of a lot of fishes coming into your pond. And it's been amazing in a sense because I'm not afraid to mix with anyone and all the industries and places like my dance community. It was a real community within those people. There were people I worked with around that, you know, and then through college, the same thing has happened where when I was acting, because I did a film television um, course at university, I'd be around a lot of people that wanted to be with me too, you know. Don't get me wrong, there are people also who don't want to be <laughs> near me, but it's always been a strive for serving other people. And I think sometimes it resonates to people who want to be served because they know that they can trust me. They know that I'll be there with them all through the process and it's a it's a partnership you know it's not an individual thing for me and I get joy from partnerships and sharing moments with people the more I do uh just trying to almost win alone you know that yeah that doesn't serve me I think some of my darkest moments have been where I've tried to do things completely alone mm. do you know what I mean mm. when you're alone you lo- you lo- you lose the kind of joy of being human mm. because you don't you need you need that alone time to learn more about yourself mm-hmm. so you need to take yourself on them walks you need to take yourself into them places you need to sit in some pain sometimes mm-hmm. to really understand who the fuck you are and what you're about mm-hmm. which I know me and you have both sat in at different times in our lives but to constantly pursue something for yourself with no, there's where's the, how, how, where does the joy come from? Because the joy for me in podcasting is simply this: when I put out this podcast review, I know it's going to change people's lives because of the way that you articulate your story and the and the way that you, the way that the way you put words together. And I know that that the way it will connect with people will create a shift in their life. Mm. And it's it's like not only do I get the presence of having the conversation with you right now. But the joy for me comes from like the lives that are shifted beyond this when it when it gets put out to the world. So it's not a singular thing. That's beautiful, man. Do you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. it's not a singular thing. You can't you can't put a price on that. Mm-hmm. And wh- and where I feel like a lot of people have gone wrong, and some people who struggle to find purpose go wrong, is they're trying to find purpose within themselves for themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think, you, and I really strongly believe this, and I want this to hit you right up in the eyeballs if you're listening to this. It's like your purpose has to involve something way bigger than you mm-hmm. to be a purpose, because mm. that's how it all links, man. I, 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 I fucking believe it so much, man. No. Well, it's true because I'd say you're serving people, right? And in return, you're almost living your purpose because you're serving those that need to hear this, and with that. They're taking actions. And whether it's not clear, you know, the first time they hear it, but it stays. It's those those words stay in your in your in your head and subconsciously Subconsciously we you yeah. cre- you can create change in the world by putting out content mm. and you can get a lot of messages, like I know you probably get a lot of messages about the videos and stuff that you put out and stuff and probably me with the podcast too but it's like it's like how many people don't contact you that have had shifts mm. that's what I'm like that's like that's mad bro you, you just reminded me and it, it's so beautiful you say this because it really shocks me that I, I don't have like a crazy Instagram following it, and I guess really it doesn't matter but there are people who've been following me since forever since I got Instagram and they've never left liked anything left a comment 
But once in a while, someone pops up and says, I've been watching your journey and it's actually touched me this way and I've never not followed you because it, yeah. it, it's affected me this way. And I just think that's so incredibly beautiful because I guess it then probably brings back to that idea, like, you know, my, my, uh, my mate's grandma, wherever you go, as long as you're putting out positive things and you're being a great leader, if you can, someone, if there's a fish that's around the pond, uh, wanting to, to, to take something from it to, to become better. And, I, and that's why I try to stay consistent in personality. When you think about what you do, in regards to creating these, which are now highly produced music videos at the top level of the game in the UK, right? You don't know how many lives, you know, how many weddings have songs that you've produced a music video been played at? You know what I mean? Where, where, where in that, where, where those people are like at a wedding or something like that, or they're at a party or it's their first dance song or like this. How many songs have people got memories on? That yeah. you've been involved with that, you, that don't know you but yeah. but you've left an impression on their life by the way that that's been produced yeah so look for for us kind of now going into a lot more music videos because beforehand we were part of songs and creating content for it lyric videos behind the scenes etc now that we're going into sort of production which would be the actual overarching look of the music video I think that will have an extra impact. But if we talk about kind of like the, the small bits that we do, because you know, we hear the songs before they go out and we create content for those songs in forms of lyric videos beforehand. It's amazing when you kind of go out and you hear those songs, you know, because you feel like you're part of it. And the reason I, I bring that up is because I don't want to like, there's so many people involved in the process of kind of a video going out and music going to out. To bring it to life, yeah. Thousands. So we, we're just as you said, like we're lucky and we get to be part of it. Tiny, but we get to be part of that. You know, I'm, I'm excited, say, next week to shoot Nathan's video, not because um, of the fact that we're just shooting his music video, but because he's the artist, I think, out of everyone we've worked with Affirmative, where we've worked from the f- bottom to the music video. Does that make sense? So if yeah. I put, put that together, it's, we're talking artwork, press photo, lyric videos, banners, billboards, um, lyric videos, content you, days, yeah. TikTok days, and then now we're doing the music video. That is your epitome of what we believe Firmative can do for each individual artist. But we get brought in, so some of the stuff that you see, we don't necessarily, we will not necessarily have done the music video but we will be part of the marketing campaign. So a different production company would have done that, but we're part of the campaign because maybe the maybe the record label wants us to do social ads, which will go on social media, and we'll cut those social medias and add animation to them. Maybe the song's already out and they need a lyric video. So we've been, labels have been putting us into projects during the process of the marketing. So for instance, with Ed Sheeran, we created visualizers. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it became part of that. So we just played a tiny part but we we believe we can do more but you were the connection between ed's music and the social audience yeah for that piece of content we do you know I mean you play the parts so i guess in an essence for ed in particular bad habits was created someone else who's not part of us created the artwork i think it was tom cotton amazing guy and we then worked on the label to create visualizers using his artwork, repurposing that. And then, so we then created a visualizer that would go out as a, as Ed Sheeran's remix with someone. And we did maybe six of those with different remixes. So that song, that remix might be someone's favorite song. And you've touched it. That, and I think that is the best way to describe it. Touched it. Don't get me wrong. We want to do more touching and that's where we're going as a production company now housed in with social content we want to be able to go to a label and say your artist has got new music we're your one stop for everything every time i listen to a every, every time when i was in australia when i was listening to a uk music and i knew that they were like around the atlantic banner or yeah. people like that i'd be like i bet i know the guy 
who's ha- who's touched this song. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? 100%. And like and like that that's what I feel for me. I'm like I know the guy that's touched this song. Yeah. I can I see a social ad for for like a and I'm like I I, I wonder if this yeah. <laughs> you know? especially you, so especially social ads like we did yeah. Yeah, social ads really kind of helped us um navigate ourselves around the record label especially Atlantic Records. We were, we were known for doing really good social ads. And to some people that's nothing, right? Like, hey man, you didn't produce the music video. Who the hell are you? To us, it was everything to just be called on to serve, to yep. serve that little bit. And they thought we would we would be significant enough to serve such a big artist. And that's that's a driving force, you know. It's all front facing. Mm. People got to understand whether you've produced a music video or not on these particular tracks. Like everything you're doing is front facing, and that front facing content that you're talking about leads them into viewing the whole track. So it's pretty fucking important, if you ask me, that that that, that is bang on, and you've you've captured that part of the market massively. But I want to know what I want to know is like when you when you've obviously you, you you do all this video editing and you've gone through all that part of your journey. And and now you've you did you did a lot of uh, club nights back in the day and all this yeah. kind of stuff and you went into that and that's kind of how you kind of I think how you I presume how you linked content creation to kind of music right yeah man and it is so exciting to talk about this because chronologically you then see it you're like oh right okay for me it was as simple as this I can get any jobs I'm gonna call the racist card but I think. I just, as a black man, you just struggled before Black Lives Matter in the UK to get really good jobs, um, let alone just any job. And I was in Lincolnshire, which uh, arguably, obviously, is a university city-based um, county. And so, you know, there aren't really a lot of many jobs going because just the maths doesn't work. There's too many students. But generally, you have to try and apply for these jobs in London, the city where anyone has equal opportunity. And I just struggled, you know. You'd go into a room and understand that that person does not want you working because they just don't like how you, how you look. And I, I want to point that out because I think a lot of black people, especially, I'm not dissing mixed race people, I love a I've got a son who's mixed race, but like, especially if you're dark, you really like understand the energy you get from someone. Like with you, what I saw you, like, that's my guy, that's my dude, that's my G. There are certain people who give you a certain yeah. feel in your environment and you know yeah. it's it's down to the fact of what you look like. Yeah, I've always just seen you as a person. Mm. And I, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't feel that. You see, you know a lot of my mates. Yeah. And, of and like, if you put all of us all together, we're like a Dulux colour chart, aren't 100%. we? From one end of the pale spectrum to the darkest end of the room, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like to Sudan, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we got all we got all spectrums of colour in that, hundred percent. And no one sees it. No. Do you know what I'm saying? Hundred percent. Like, like no one's looking at you, thinking, "Are oh, you the?" No one's. I, I, you've, I don't think you've ever looked at me and thought, "Are oh, you a white guy?" Nah. Do you know? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like that. That's uh, like it's. I get it. I yeah. get. I get. I get what you feel. Yeah. But then on the other side. The, but and here's one thing when it comes to this color thing that everyone mm. talks about or or people love to push upon people mm. you can either take color as a disempowering thing mm. and you could you could have took it as like as and a lot of people sometimes can take it as a disempowering thing and then they go on this mission and they create a void between them and the other people because they've took a disempowering point of view right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whereas you've gone do you know what? Nah, this this just I'm just going to elevate with this, yeah. And that's the that's the power in it. It's how you take it. Yeah, hundred percent. I I actually saw it as an advantage personally because yeah. it would fuel me. Just off the story you told me, you know what that, what I've told you about my life in general. That that was an advantage. I thought, okay, cool. This should really creatively push me into a place where I do something else. And so when I was getting these jobs, I was thinking, okay, I'm I. I'm grateful for today. I'm also grateful that I didn't get that opportunity. And so yeah. I would always go, okay, so if I'm not getting this opportunity, what's next? What's next? Like, well, what am I going to do? And at university, I thought I love club nights and I went to a really bad one at Lincoln University because it just didn't play the music I would listen to in Peterborough when I danced with my friends. I thought, well, I'm going to be here for three years. Someone better come up with a good night that's going to play R&B and hip hop, the music I love, so I can selfishly dance to this, but also serve others who love this music. And then eventually, as as it turns out, uh, loved a, a brand that was been running that was running from two thousand and one. The person Matt 
uh, who then become on my business partner, launches it in Lincoln subjectively because there wasn't anything in Lincoln. And he thought, quick money, Lincolnshire, don't really care about this. And he had done so much with the brand, travelled it around the place. He was well known for it at the time. And he was on his way out, just like, I'm just going to chill. I own a club called Tup Tup in Newcastle, going to chill. Met me there and I fell in love with it. I was like, that's me, music, people, this is me, everything. So I, I that fantasy, it's like I see something within this space that is me and I want to take it. I want to take it to, to the top. And so I spent my time at university sort of working, obviously making sure I get the grades for my mum mainly and for experience in video production. But I went, did Lovedo and it ended up being quite a successful way to make money. And so to elevate that and ensure that everyone was able to come to my club night, because it was on a Monday night and no one would go to it, I thought, let me use video and put it on social, Facebook, you know? And no one was doing that in those early days. No one was really utilising video. It was all about artwork. So then I'd shoot the video, put some fancy things around it, maybe add a music video in there or shoot the night itself. And I just started to see ticket sales go up. I thought, hey, like, th- this is actually working just using video content. So I started to use video content as the way to sell as many tickets as I can, not only to earn an income for myself, but to get people down there because I didn't want to dance on my own. Like 80 people in a club, that holds 600 people, right? Ain't no good to anyone. I needed all 600 in there. So, and it was a Monday. I thought it was challenging because I didn't see it as a bad thing because no one went out on a Monday. Yeah. I thought because no one is going out on a Monday, if I make it a place to go out, it becomes the, the biggest Monday night, right? That was the fantasy. And I'd use my video skills to develop as a videographer because then... When I was done with this, I could take those skills somewhere else. Somewhere else, transferable skills. Transferable skills, but be able to, to to actually use this as a case study. I wasn't thinking that far in, but I thought there was some logic in trying because I, I, that was my last, that was my only option at the time. So it worked, and the, the night became not only the the biggest one in in Lincoln, but it ended up I ended up touring with the event. We'd launch it in different cities, at, still in Newcastle. I went to Dubai with the brand and it ended up being kind of like my first business, I guess, because I became a partner with Matt. And the reason I probably speak the way I do, the reason I know business is because of him, because I met him at the right time. He had just come out of an accident and he just wanted to make some quick money. We met and he's been like my stepdad. And he's guided you, he's guided guided me through all branding without him realizing protected me you know called me up on my bullshit so you know when you start when i say i was going through a lot of chaos da 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 he was on the guideline watching the chaos but just helping me you know do me you need to look at your maths your maths isn't good you need you need to do the pnl business if you want to build a business look at the pnl look at the numbers don't just get all caught up dancing around in the club, getting pit, getting drunk, pissed, whatever. Look at the numbers. Why are you doing this night? And he would ask all these challenging things. And you yeah. had to learn. I had to learn. He would ask about me. How am I feeling? How are you? He would tell me little things like, you know, okay, that apartment is expensive, but you need, to, you need to always have a place that is safe to stay. So when you wake up in the morning, you can go again. You know, just little things like that. That would stay with Yeah. You. Yeah, because pe- sometimes people can be a little bit adverse to investing in themselves, mm. and it's it's like you got you know if you wanna if you wanna elevate the way that you want to elevate, you gotta you gotta throw some cash at it. Yeah. So you you use the club nights to generate the cash to invest in your equipment, to invest yeah. in your learning, to invest in in you know you were you were essentially getting paid at that time yeah. to learn videography, to learn business. To learn to, le- to to you know to learn how how systems work in businesses and how 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 to you know even even like I'm sure that you learn like angle you know, when you're filming a DJ like the angles of the camera and everything like yeah. that you learn in those moments so now you could accentuate and do what you're doing now. Hundred percent. Uh, did you wait until a certain point till you made enough money in it, within that before you set up affirmative then? Yeah, yeah. So. Well, when I started to think about th- firm, firmative, I started to 
figure out what I could do for DJs. Because I thought, if I start with DJs, artists maybe are too much of a reach. So if I do it for a DJ, because I love the DJs, um, I might maybe create a DJ company that is social media for DJs. And so the DJs loved the content I was doing in generally to to promote them for my event that were going, I'm going away. I want to pay you to go away with me, New York, or to go away with me, Miami. I thought, oh my God, I could tell stories, I could document their stories, back to film with my friend. Your whole life has been a story, bro. Right. So Just then, hit me, man. <laughs> so I'm like, of course, this is something I used to do when I was younger. That's how it started. I documented dancers, the rest of it. I'm documenting DJs. And so I documented... Um, these people have become my best friends by the way I documented uh, DJ Jonesy Jonesy whose wedding I just went to last week and I documented his journey quite well and bro when I tell you he once rang me and he was crying on the phone and he was just like what you've done for me and he still does it today I can't take it in but it's like you have really elevated my DJing but also it's elevated my vision being around you thinking about the future before this I wouldn't have toured and been around all these circles had you not been doing these videos for me. Um, I've got another friend called Andy who kind of went through the same process. And yeah, Is that that Andy person? Andy, Andy Pernell, yeah. yeah. yeah, he, yeah. He, he was a banker before. He's an accountant. I'm not saying like I changed it. He he just wasn't too sure at the time whether he was going to leave accounting. And the parties would run with him. The way we took him in, he was my best friend. We, we, we loved having him around. We'd promote the, the hell out of him that was the that was his first weekly night that he went you know what I'm changing I'm not going to be a banker anymore I'm going to go back to DJing he's so huge right now I'm not saying I was responsible for that but it it's nice to you've just played you've touched it you've played that part yeah it felt like I was serving them and I was comfortable doing that I could do that for free you know and then I thought hey maybe an artist Maybe, and I think I jumped straight into the artist thing quite. Uh, I had had the money now, and I thought I need to go into the artist thing right now. I had the equipment, I had the experience, I had the almost like your, your profile of what can happen to a club night. I can do that for artists to sell tickets, to sell music. You had all this content. I had all this content. That you'd been paid for producing. To back up, to back up, to showcase what you could do for these artists now. Yeah, yeah, and I was ready. I was ready um, to do that first. I I randomly went to New York. Just decided I was gonna, if I was gonna break through, I was gonna do it in New York. I don't know why. Um, I think maybe that might be fantasy from being younger. You know, walking down. I thought, let's try America. So I went to New York, and my idea just pretty stupid at the time, but I had a bit of money to play around with from the events, was to go on, knock on these doors, Warner Music, um, Universal Music, just go and get a meeting with them and say, hey, I'm from the UK. I'd use my British accent. I played it out of my head. And that would be a way to sort of connect with them. And they would realise that I was determined and hungry because I was coming from the UK. That didn't work out at all. Like every door I went to security just candid like who the hell do you think you are but one person did there was a guy called Richard who started up ITV2 from the UK had an office in New York and I met him we spoke I told my story much similar to this and we just got on so well and he connected me back to the UK with Fremantle Media that gave me access into TV just to see if my dream maybe was much more about TV and not social so I then went into TV runs where I'd do things like Celebrity Juiced, Britain's Got Talent, X Factor, all these different things. Realised there wasn't much in there, but there was a message. There was the last day I did in Liverpool for X Factor. And I remember the guys asking, why is no one turning up? It was like the 10th anniversary of the, of the X Factor. Uh, so Britain's Got Talent it was for that time. And the reason people weren't turning up is because no one was watching the advertising on, on TV anymore. People were spending more time on their phones. And I was saying, hey, like, have you tried Facebook ads, video, video content? It works for my club lines. Like, you know, they were like, no. 
and I was like, I need to go now and build Firmative because not even these execs who are senior producers don't know. Don't know. And apparently I know and I've been doing it for the last six years. I was like, that's where I'm going. Um, but eventually I got connected to the record label through a friend of mine who just wanted me to sit down in a meeting with a manager uh, called Josh, who's the guy I was telling you about. Yeah. Who's telling me about this other business opportunity. And Josh just, whatever he saw in me in that meeting, was like, we're getting you to work with an artist called Dan Kaplan, who was signed to Atlantic Records at the time. And he had a song at the time, which was number one, These Days. These days, these days. <laughs> that one. <laughs> and then, yeah, he, he wanted content. He's similar to me. And we got on really well. And he, he, he I think he left the record, uh, he left the label eventually. But before he left, he was connecting me to um, a junior marketing manager at the time called Tristan, who's now the head of marketing at Atlantic. But through the journey, Tristan has been the one that remembers how hard working I was, how determined I was to try and do the best I can for Dan, take photos, videos. I do everything to give Dan all the best content he could do. He gave me my first shot to shoot, to create some ads for Joe Corey's music video at the time where Joe Corey was just signed and worked. He's worked gone with, on to be massive, hasn't he? Yeah. And, you know, Tristan probably connected me with everyone in in the music industry. And Tristan's actually <laughs> the reason why I'm doing No Friends of Music Video next week. Uh, probably, you know, and he's introduced me with everyone in the music industry. Uh, and that's probably why I work a lot with Atlantic Records. And that's why Firmative's done so well. Just trust the people who know my mentality and what I'm here for. Like, I'm not here to show off or anything. Like I'm here to... Because you love you love to help people express their vision, yeah, is is is, is essentially what you do, and tell their story through video, yeah, literally. And you've literally, like I've said several times in this podcast, you've literally created that in your mind from when you were a kid, mm-hmm. and you subconsciously didn't realize it. No, didn't it probably, it probably, it probably actually hit you when you walk out of this podcast today. It probably actually all, on the way home, it might even hit you how much you've created when you were a kid. Definitely, it's already been hitting me as we talk. Um, just as I've found myself actually speaking a lot more than I usually do, just it's making sense, you know, connecting it all together. Like I say something, I'm like, like I told you before. Oh no, I didn't even know. You know, yeah, I, I, everything yeah. kind of connects. D- mate, so you've you've now scaled that to a few, few different staff, haven't you? You've got a few different staff that work for you and... You obviously built that from, you started off on your own. And you, How many staff do you have working for you now? So we, we went from five to three. And the reason for it is, um, I, I explain the structure because we actually work with like over 40 freelancers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people who are in this space, the good ones who love music, are specific videographers who actually would rather work for themselves, be sole traders be freelance because they won't have the ability to explore the market just because there's... So you act as the overarching brand that ties these 40 people together. Yeah, yeah. So no exclusive contracts. You go make as much money as you can from wherever you are. We'll use specific people that we love working with who are very good at what they do, who match, most importantly, match the artist and what the artist is like, not just in personality, in music, in style... I'll make sure that's connected well. And so we're a team of three going back on to six, just employing a few people here as we speak now. And the, the office is filled with people who take care of freelancers and also people who are in the creative department designing in-house. Yeah, And so to a certain extent, you could say we will connect, we're an agency will connect an, an artist with the right videographer underneath the affirmative um, banner. banner, but also policies. But we'll run the creative from start to finish in the creative and the cre- creator, say a videographer, would come in and serve their part. They get served their bit. Um, 
the art, but most importantly, the artist has to win, right? Like the artist has to get the the service that they asked for. The label have to get the pieces of content they need to get the artist to the top. And our whole motivation is: it's not about you, videographer A. It's not about me. We're literally here to do the best we can to get um, that artist to, to the to top pull, charts. To pull to pull that vision out of their head and then get them to the top of the charts. Yeah. Essentially, you've got to connect that vision, the vision for what they truly want to put out into the world and how they want to articulate that, pull it out their head into a vision of video format and then put that to the top of the charts. Yeah. How many of your pieces now have created number one records? In the UK, I, the it, it's tough to say because I would never say that. I wouldn't say our piece is made number one record, but I would say a lot of parts that we've played, that the songs we have been involved in a lot of number ones. Yeah, didn't I, I see? Do. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't I see you once doing with that DJ that you talked about earlier? I'm sure he was doing something with KSI, wasn't he? Yeah. So you got to you got to film with KSI and KSI is a local boy, isn't he? Like he's 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 from he's from he's from near around there, isn't he? Him and his brother. Yeah, yeah, well his brother's moved here, isn't he? His brother's moved to Pete. Well he's um he's still in London, KSI still lives in London. But um yeah, so we, we worked on Lighter and again that's Tristan's project from Atlantic Records and we what we actually did was the behind the scenes for that. We did a different versions that will that currently sit on KSI's Instagram um, YouTube she did really well so they played their part we didn't shoot the main music video um, a different production company did but we worked around that you know and so but, but again I'd like to go back to this point it's like when I saw those videos on social mm. again I thought I know who's touched that <laughs> do you know what I mean that, yeah. that's, and that for me as a friend is like is like an amazing thing to feel from my point of view it's like when I see when I see that I'm like, ah, oh, he's 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 doing he's doing everything I know he can do. I like, do you know that, what man. I mean? Like, I see that, and and I and that's had millions of eyeballs on it, mate. And and that is beautiful. That is that is the most beautiful part of it all. It's the fact that there's millions of people out there that are, that have seen that, felt that it's touched them in however way it's touched them. But but and it's all it's like you know that that. It's been facilitated by your production company that, that that got built out of you getting on this course years ago, <laughs> that you, and that was just a way to please your mum because you wanted to do these dance nights. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, isn't that an amazing way of putting things together? And it just it just baffles me, like how the world works and how it all comes together in the end. Like, it, it confuses me, and, th- and thank you for that, man. And it confuses me sometimes, but we we just honestly. I, I speak to Danny and Evans, who are the, the, the two, and I guess collectively we're, we're three. And then the three people who are coming on board because they've been working too often with us. And we're like, okay, let's just come come in full time so we can build this together. But we, every day, go, are we not lucky doing what we do? We're reminded, humbled by what we do. We don't get complacent. Because yeah. I think we love what we do individually, you know? And so... And you get to now co-create together. Yeah, 100%. And the other thing is, I'm now in, I guess, a place where I really have to hone into what what exactly my purpose is. And what my direction now is trying to stop my ego from trying to be the person who is celebrated. You know, stopping me from trying to be, oh, Demi's the best director Demi's the best videographer. Demi's the best photographer. I'm really now, and it's been really hard, quite a hard journey, trying to step away from all that and really hone into the service by creating opportunities for creators, creatives to come in, people who do those bits that we do for the label, bring in the best directors instead of me directing everything. Don't get me wrong, at the moment I am, but the mission now is slightly to be able to get the best directors, the best producers, the best designers, all around firm to, to serve the artist, because that that matters more. That's bigger than me, you know. And it's it's such a large picture that we've had quite a lot of interest. Where places like the University of Lincoln are going, hey, like let's really have a sit down about that and really try and get involved, so we can 
bring the best creators into your system you know so they they act so now you've got universities reaching out saying to you hang on a minute we would like to facilitate the creatives getting into firmative and getting on firmative roster Mm. because we see the value in them the experience that you can give those creatives out of our system Yeah, yeah i love that and i'd like to think the record labels i think in the same like if you call me he he'll get it done he'll 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 fix that you know or firmative will fix that I, I love that now on the call sheet say we're doing behind the scenes they'll say they'll just put behind the scenes firmative it's like that's beautiful because they trust whoever's on there they, they trust the team rather yeah. than you so you've removed that bottleneck of being that person yourself exactly and then now we're going to doing our own production the top is affirmative and everyone in there including behind the scenes and the producers the directors all are underneath the uh, umbrella of what we're what our mission is and everyone understands everyone's had the conversation with me about what we're trying to create here uh for the creator and the music in, rega- in regards to how the creators come on board do they just come on board on, on set wages or do they do they own a piece of the company or what how does the structure work in that respect yes so th- Everyone, most creators are freelancers. It comes down to a conversation about who that creator is, what they're doing, what they're expected of, and what the fee looks like. And it's the first conversation above all. Um, you know, and we set the fee. We set the fee if based on the budget that we have. And then we collaborate within that. But the intention isn't to just find anyone. Hey, mate, do you want to come do this one-off yeah. job? The intention is we see us working with you for a long time not one project a few the intention is we want your talent to be part of this and we want to give back we're going to give you the value for it the money for yeah. it you know you're not working on nothing we and want to make access sure. and access, access access that you've worked 12 20 years to create you can now give to a young creative at 18 who's wicked but would never get that opportunity to work on that music video unless he was coming under the affirmative banner 100%, 100%. That's that's the future. And look, at the moment, we're lucky. Uh, there's a guy called Tom who, um, like an example, who, who was experienced before and had done a lot of shoots. And it's just amazing to sort of see that he's regularly working with us on almost like a daily basis on different projects. And it's great to get feedback from him saying that there's value in what we do because he, he loves working with us. And people like him um, are kind of like, how do I put it? I've been, I've been fortunate to have them because I think they they could do all of this without us. But it's just really nice and pure to see that they are also working a lot with us and giving us the feedback and saying, "Hey, I enjoy this, and here's what I don't like." Because I'm experienced, here's what I don't like. Here's what I do like. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because then what that does is for the newer creators or the medium creators, you have that away. feedback loop yeah of of constant improvement exactly because he, he's more experienced he can go mate like i usually have this in place before i do this job and i go you know or he'll say i don't mind turning the video around quickly but we, i mean we really need to start thinking about charging for a premium price and i'm like affirmative prime you know like that service because yeah. he's willing he just feels uncomfortable doing it for the same and it's like okay that brings more value to the record label because they can have things quicker but there's a fee on top that Tom will, will, will yeah, yeah, enjoy yeah, doing yeah, that. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Because because when when you have any interaction with people, mm. whether it's a sales interaction or whatever, but like it's like you've got to you've got to, you've got to leave that with a with a mutual feeling of like you know you've won and I've won. Yeah, and that's what people fail to get about the psychology of humans. It's mm. like. Whenever you leave that conversation, you don't want to leave feeling like you've won mm. or taken some or taken too much from that conversation because now you've just disempowered that relationship going forward with that with that person. Mm. So you, you always want to try where possible to leave with that win win. Mm-hmm. So that cements relationships, and you'll do so much more business by by always looking for the win win, yeah. even if it means in that moment. And I've had this with, um, especially with creative people on the back of the podcast, like. Just, just, just overpay or pay, or pay, or pay, or, or pay what you need to pay, and just 
to, you know what I mean? Because if you, you do, that's thing you want is when someone's creating a piece of content, mm-hmm. is for them to not love what they're doing. Yeah, because you loved what you were doing when you were speaking on the speaking on the podcast, for example, in my in my instance. So I loved what I was doing, mm-hmm. but to, but to then to then not you know to have someone begrudgingly make you a video is just not you're not just not going to get the same you just not when you see the video you're just not going to feel it no. so so you, so in every relationship you have always try and always try and look for that win win especially when arguing with a woman <laughs> <laughs> and and mate that 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 is hard and yeah. it's 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 so like it's so pure to have a conversation with you uh, about this because it is a daily challenge um to to meet those demands because at the end of the day, you do have a, a business to run. So the thing I focus on is stepping back and thinking about my morals. You know, like, what am I trying to do here? You know, like, do I want to win alone? And I go back to my painful times. Like, the most painful times I've had have been when I focused on me winning. You know, and the more I'm detracting myself from a position where I have to think I have to win, the more and more I started to, be, the more and more it's becoming more and more clear that my morals um, have to be aligned to serve that creator. And I'm listening and I'm going, that's what you're saying is really frustrating, but I'm listening because I, I, I want to serve you. And I hope that you, you get that back from me. And I think the more and more I've done that, affirmative has just gone boom. Yeah. And the more I've done with the artist and gone, okay marketing manager are frustrated about XXX that doesn't matter I'm here to serve the artist what 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 can I do yes 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 because many times in my life say you get a bad piece of feedback on something mm. and you take it personally you yeah. take it as a wound mm-hmm. it's like just you know you, just know in your in your head that you've, you've tried to serve the world the best but you, just be open to listening I'm, I've had to listen to some feedback from my friends about this podcast. Mm-hmm. Some of it, I'm like, fuck, I don't really like hearing that. But they've got my best interest at heart. Mm. You know, mm. sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not nice when you, when no. you cl- Frankie, you, got, you do this, you do this, you do. You got to stop doing that. You got. Uh, okay, cool. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because you're my day one. Mm-hmm. You've been around me for twelve, fifteen, sixteen years. Mm. You're not here. There's there's no point of reference in time where you've ever st- tried to steer me in the wrong direction, or I've ever tried to steer you in the wrong direction. Mm. So I respect you for that. Thank you, yeah. and then take it on board. Do you know what I mean? And that's and that's been that's been one of my learning curves. And I suppose I suppose when you're sat there in this meeting, you're just like, do you know what? What the question would probably be along the lines of like, what 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 do you actually want from this? Like, what do, what is it that you actually want as a as a creator that that, that you don't feel you're getting right now? Because yeah. and it's like those kind of questions mm-hmm. can kind of really pull out of someone mm-hmm. the true feeling. Oh well, I just want you know fifty pound more. Okay, let's fifty pound then. If that if it's if it's the difference between you loving this yeah. and being able to go and create this with joy and yeah. you not is fifty pound, then have fifty pound. Do you not? Do you, do, and yeah. that's and that's what I want everyone to get. Whereas if you leave that conversation and they're fucking annoyed because yeah. they, they don't have whatever whatever would just serve their purpose and it might only be something that like literally as much as fifty pound, then it's not worth it. Hundred percent. And then look, here's the flip side, right? The flip side is you are working underneath tight budgets, right? And you've got to work that based on the budget you've been given. So at times, which is quite a regular thing in the music industry, you do get a creator that wants a lot more than the budget. You, you can't do that. You Not only is the label going to lose money, you're going to lose a lot more money and time. You know, so in my early stages, I was just flooding, like whatever, cool, losing, losing, losing. Um, and that didn't matter because I was trying to learn the industry. But when I start to understand that if, we're ever going to grow and this is ever going to become a a, a place where everyone is secure we actually need to build some cash flow to 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 facilitate it and it's like oh my god of course and this came from my business partner on the other business man he was like look like a business actually has to make money so you can facilitate stuff and so we've had to be really careful to navigate budgets that make sense and sometimes we want certain creators and you come to a budget clash and it's like 
we'll be back you know like th- this is not we'll come end. back into very different project yeah. but you can't do this one because yeah. we, we just can't make it work but and also we can't disrespect your fee we what you do we want we can't afford that so a lot of stuff I, I a lot of jobs I did them myself myself and Danny so in the early stages it was just Danny Danny would create design artwork for Nath Joe Corey and all these people do lyric videos all that and he was the creative department I was the video guy, core, whenever, I'd do it. And I would pro- project manage everything. And I just worked extremely hard. Because I had, you know what I mean, with my mindset, nothing to lose. Any day, whenever, call me, whatever. Because I had a little bit of money from the other business. I'd go and do things for either free, I'd lose money. But I had to show them what I was trying to build as firm as it was possible. And even, even if it was two people, the principles were right. I just knew it was right. So I'd go there and be able to shoot a video come off stage I'll be on my laptop and people are like you're mad I'm like I ain't mad I, I see it I see the vision you see it I see it so this is right now this is the moment da, 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 da. be it you go picture video and it there was just complete shock in those early stages and I say that now because we've we push our videographers to do that but in those early stages no one would do that so it was a shock to the system that this guy is here doesn't he's know. hungry yeah I forget about my train, don't care what time it is. A company called Livebase really saw that and saw the effects of it. I'd go shoot a club night with an eye, say ASAP Rocky, shoot it, don't care, whatever environment, whatever. I'm there, doing channel focused into shooting that video, making it the best video they can. And I, would, I wouldn't stop until creatively, the, the, the feeling I was having from the music and the moment, I wanted to show Livebase audience that this is how good the, the events they do are. This is how much access, this is how amazing the artists, like ASAP, ASAP's having a good time here. There's girls around that they're having a good time too. So to have that and create this editing style that they would then post. So ASAP would come off stage 2 a.m., 2.30, videos up. People were like, what? And you can check it, there's a thread of like live-based videos that were just going up at like stupid o'clock. Then I'd figure out, oh, where, where am I, London? Ah, oh, I don't have a train, uh, yeah, we'll figure it out. I'll stay at McDonald's until I have my first train back back to Lincoln. And I'd repeat that. It would t- send me to Ibiza. Same thing, Future. Cool, Future's playing. There's your video. Did you ever do things like Craig David and all all these boys? So, Live Bass are mainly focused on hip-hop and R&B artists. So, they did Future, ASAP Rocky, Sweet A, is that what her name is? Just a bunch of, a lot of like a, a thread of them, you know, of American artists, hip hop American artists. And then Atlantic Records obviously would, I would then transfer those skills slowly yeah, yeah, yeah. Over. to Atlantic and say, you know, give me more opportunities to do this. Yeah. Then lockdown happened and I wasn't able to go into club nights to or shows to show my part of the skill. Did lockdown have a massive effect on fir- affirmative uh, like revenue and all that stuff? It had a progressive effect. Because in those moments where, as I was saying to you, where you find yourself in these moments where you feel locked and behind that you feel trapped. And I thought, I've been here so many times because of my life. And I had to, I thought, hey, I'm grateful for the good times. I'm grateful for now, you know, like I'm grateful for. But he gave you the time to think. Yeah, like what do I need creatively to do that? And I really dived into what I was telling you about meditation and working out, like got into really good shape and mentally I was just connected with being younger. I I remember I'd run like maybe like 10K. Is this in Zambia? No, in when lockdown happened. No, I mean, did you, did you, did you, did you remember when you're saying you remember when you're younger? I mean, yeah. did you run in Zambia? Like, like, no, like, no, no. The, the, I was walking in Zambia, but when I started to run, mm. I'd, I'd run through the, everything I had gone through as a younger person. So yeah. I remember myself walking my dreams. What were they? So as I'm running, I'm recycling what, what yeah. how I ended up here. But eventually it came down to service and I thought music artist right now at home, they need serving somehow, some way. So creatively we did, we then advanced onto these lyric videos, these visualizers artwork didn't you didn't you didn't didn't i see you also you filmed some 
DJing at home, like you're helping DJs film themselves at home going live to yeah. on on social medias and that. Yeah, we did a few live streams, and I was just actively trying to keep creative. Um, we did do a few live streams, and then when the music industry was allowed quite early to start shooting, because of the creative stuff we were doing, um, the label would then invite us to come and shoot a behind the scenes at music video. And then we kept those relationships so well with the same philosophy, go in there, serve the artist, do the best you can, you know, deliver quicker than anyone has ever done. The artist needs that video to push their music. Then when lockdown opened, that's where, we, you know, Affirmative went whoop in lockdown. But then when the gates opened where production was there, that's where we launched Affirmative, the production yeah, side of it. Because yeah, then yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like your creative engine for the creative department boosted the video side of it boosted because of space and we're now just trying to navigate um all that extra scaling. work you've yeah. picked up through scaling yeah i love it what's your ultimate vision then for affirmative now honestly to be the one-stop shop for creative i want to go to labels and be able to serve as many artists as we can are we talking uk are we talking globally are we talking global Global. So, global. affirmative offices in in the US, like LA, New York, affirmative offices in London, affirmative office in South Africa, all that kind of stuff is is the vision you have for this now. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's all down to the idea, you know, what affirmative stands for, serving the artist, connecting the creative to serve the artist, you know, and in a space where digital is huge that's diverse that can be diversified into um web 3.0 as it comes in and we want to be able to be the first people to dive socially and create content for all artists that need to sell their music you know a song comes out for an artist we want to be able to facilitate all the deliverables the content uh, assets that are needed to get the song out wherever whether it's tiktok um, or whether it's bloody Web 3.0 or NFT XX, whatever. Yeah, we, you we just want you just want to be able to facilitate whatever piece of content needs to be put on that platform. Yeah. You want to be able to facilitate the 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 filming, the editing, and the construction of how that content sits on on any on any platform or social. Yeah, exactly. And the design, uh, you know, the design and everything else. So that that's the vision. One stop shop for creative, uh, for every you know, with every single record label globally facilitating. And live you'll do it man advice. you'll do it if there's one lad I know that'll do it it's you bro I've, I've seen it since for years bro there's no there's no question in my mind there's no Appreciate question that, I, was, I was saying that to you before the before this podcast there's there's not a doubt in my mind of what you're gonna do and there's never been a doubt in my mind ever since we were young man like serious no no question you you, you everything the, everything I've seen so far man there's no denying it'll all come the one thing I want to say before we leave this podcast from the whole from every from everything that you've gone through in your life from 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 from, from being a kid in Zambia to, to come into the UK and everything you've been through in your whole journey if you were going to check out the planet today and you, you couldn't leave nothing behind, but you could just leave a key concept, a, a massive learning that you could leave for the people that could just shift and dramatically move their life forward. What would that learning be? I think take time to get to know who you are. Um, I said this the other day, work harder on yourself than you do on your, on your job because you can walk into rooms completely feeling comfortable knowing you know who you are so you can walk into spaces and be the best person you can with the best morals and be able to serve people correctly because because you, you know you know who you are and some people might not see it but you see it you know exactly what it, what, that, what that person is and yeah and that comes with working on yourself every single day a lot harder than what you think you should work on your on your job mate that's some powerful shit <laughs> bro it's been an absolute fucking pleasure, man. Thank you, Honestly, man. I swear down. Absolute game changer. Guys, do me a solid favour, yeah, and, and I'll put Dumi's link to his socials, his, his business page and his personal page. Uh, under this podcast somewhere, you'll find links to his. So give him a follow on social. 
share this podcast if it resonates with you. And and I know you might have shared other shared other podcasts that that I've recorded, and I massively appreciate all the support and all the shares of of the content. But if you could just as a podcast that's really trying to trying to grow and accentuate in this space, I would every time you hear a piece of content that resonates with you, could if you could just give a share, send it to other people, spread them, help me spread the message. I'm really trying to build something that I'm so so passionate about, and I just want to touch so many people with this content for the right reasons. And getting lads like Do Me on here and and other people that I've had on just just to kind of put in your ears to give you a different perspective of how life should be and how, and how to move yourself forward. I just that really lights me up on a different level, and I don't even know I don't I don't know if you can feel that, but I fucking feel it every day that I wake up with with the purpose to do this. So if 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 you resonate if you'd be so kind as to put this in someone else's ears or a few other people's ears, I would massively appreciate it. And I just want to say like, this will be episode, I think this will be episode 90. I, sorry about that. I, I, no man, you go for it. I tell you now guys, right? This is episode 90 and I've never felt so on purpose in my entire life than I have throughout this pod, podcasting game and all the learnings that I've had through it. And I massively appreciate every one of you that sent me a message, that shared the content and everything else through this journey because it's helped me more than you'll ever know in your lives. So I just wanted to say that to you at the end of this podcast. So much love. Hope you've enjoyed the content and check it out. Don't forget to subscribe to the Frankie Lee Podcast.